Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. We know the Bible can be hard to understand and complicated to sort out all the different uh, issues and questions that you may have as you're reading it for yourself and trying to interpret it. So what we're wanting to do in this series is just to provide some background information, some context, and some helpful resources for you to interpret the Bible. So here's what we want you to know before you read. The story of Jonah is one of the most popular and well-known stories in the Old Testament. Jonah is considered one of the minor prophets. Now, as with all the minor prophets, it's called minor because of its length, not because of its significance or value. In the Hebrew Bible, Jonah is included in the Twelve, a collection of twelve prophetic works in one collection, which is, par which is part of the Nevi'im, or prophets. The book of Jonah is a short four-chapter book. The story follows the titular character, Jonah, who is called to go to Nineveh and preach against their wickedness. Instead, he flees God's calling by running the opposite direction, tries to escape his prophetic duties by boat, gets tossed overboard during a storm, is swallowed by a fish, and ends up going to Nineveh after the fish vomits him onto dry land. Now, there, according to the story, the people of Nineveh repent. A happy ending for everybody, right? But Jonah is upset. He wanted to see God destroy the people of Nineveh instead of seeing them repent and be spared. God chastises Jonah with a rhetorical question of whether or not God should have a compassion on this large city of people who do not know God's law. The story ends with that question left up in the air. The book itself begins with the phrase, The word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai. The story of the book follows Jonah, but it isn't obvious who actually wrote the book. It's presumably meant to be understood as the work of a prophet named Jonah. Now, there is one Jonah that's mentioned in 2 Kings 14. He was a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam reigned from the 780s to the 750s BC, the early to mid-8th century. Jeroboam ruled for a long time, according to the Book of Kings, 41 years. His reign was marked by both military and economic success. The text says he restored the borders of Israel and capitalized on the demise of the Aramean state in Damascus. It also says that he did not depart from the sins of the kings of Israel. Now, this is understood to mean worshiping other gods besides Yahweh, as well as worshiping Yahweh in non-sanctioned ways, including worshiping idols and images of Yahweh. Jeroboam II's reign was also marked by a lot of prophetic activity. Jonah was just one of several prophets who were active in the mid-8th century. The text suggests that Jonah brings the message that God will save the people of Israel through the king Jeroboam II. And so according to 2 Kings, Jonah brought a message of forgiveness and repentance to Jeroboam, just as in the book of Jonah, he brought a similar message to an otherwise evil king in Nineveh. Now there isn't much else in the text that tells us about Jonah. It says he was the son of Amittai and he was from Gath Hefer, a site that is in the allotment of Zebulun, according to the book of Joshua. It was about 15 miles west of the Sea of Galilee. Now, he's really a pretty obscure character outside of the famous book that bears his name. But as we'll see, while this Jonah is likely the figure that is being referenced in its most, it's most certainly not the actual author of the book. The book of Jonah is difficult to classify by genre. Genres are particular types of literature that help us set limits and expectations on both the writer and the reader. These limits and expectations help the writer write and the reader to comprehend any given work. So what genre is Jonah? Now, it's certainly a prophetic book that d combines both narrative and poetic elements, a combination that we see in a number of other prophetic books. But how should we read the book? Should it be read as an historical narrative? Is it a parable or a legend? Is it a true fish story? Many scholars have highlighted ironic elements in the text that can help us understand what kind of work this book is. In literature, irony is an implicit conflict between two different points of view. And here it's the conflict between Jonah's view and God's view. Others see a harsher tone, and they read Jonah as satire or even a parody. Scholars have suggested that Jonah is a parody of things like the call to prophesy and the prophetic critique of idolatry. Now, the problem with this reading is that if it is satire or parody, we should probably know what is being satirized or parodied. A satire or parody loses its effect if we don't know what's being critiqued. 
and in the book of Jonah, it isn't obvious what that would be. Some have plausibly suggested it's cr critiquing the strict nationalistic reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah. Scholars continue to debate the genre of Jonah, but I think the best approach is probably to simply treat the book like a simple story or novella. Like all good stories, it has multiple messages and themes, and can be understood in a number of different ways. It includes elements of parody and irony, but those are only part of the complexity of the book of Jonah. Now, as with the author, it isn't obvious when Jonah was written. As we've seen, it's such a well-known story, but Jonah is not very straightforward when we try to place it in a broader context. When we try to figure out when the text was written, there are a few tools at our disposal. Our best tool is probably going to be textual evidence. Now, we've seen that the only biblical reference to Jonah, son of Amittai, places him in the mid-8th century. And when we look at the actual text of Jonah, there are some clues that point to the book of Jonah being even later, in the 6th century. Now, for example, Jonah seems to have references to other texts like Joel and Jeremiah. And as we've seen with the dating of other prophetic books, this poses a problem of who is quoting whom here. Is Jonah referencing Jeremiah, or is it the other way around? Are they both referencing another source that we don't have anymore? Now, this piece of evidence doesn't lead to a definite conclusion. Perhaps more convincingly, there are some words and phrases which are used in Jonah which are used in other texts that we know are post-exilic, from the 6th century and later. For example, the phrase God of Heaven in Jonah 1.9 is mainly used during the post-exilic period as a description of God. And additionally, the vocabulary in Jonah shows influences from Aramaic, which we know influenced the Hebrew language during and after the exilic period. There are also cultural practices we see in the book which are elsewhere described as practices done under the Persians, the kingdom which allowed for the exiles to return to Judah. These practices include edicts being issued by kings and officials, as well as the inclusion of animals in mourning practices. Now, given these clues, a composition date of the 6th century or later seems plausible on linguistic grounds. When we look at the presumed setting of the book, this dating is further solidified. If we assume the book was written in the 6th century, as the linguistic evidence suggests, then we can try to examine when the story is presumably set. When we dig into some of the details in the text and then compare that with what we know from history and archaeology, there are some pretty interesting results. Second Kings says that Jonah lived during the reign of Jeroboam II, which is sometime between the 780s and the 750s BC. Now, during this time, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was in a period of decline. In the 790s, the Assyrians had destroyed the Aramean kingdom at Damascus, which allowed Israel, under Jeroboam II, to expand its territory and economic reach. Now, the Assyrians, however, faced a series of ineffectual kings, coupled with rebellions and internal struggles that kind of kept them out of the way of the kings of Israel and Judah for a while. So during the lifetime of the historical Jonah, the Assyrians were only a distant threat. Now, furthermore, the capital of the Assyrian Empire was at Assur, under the, until the mid-9th century, and during the lifetime of the historical Jonah, it was at Kalhu, or modern-day Nimrud. Nineveh only became the capital of Assyria and the leading city in the world at the end of the 8th century, during the reign of Sennacherib. Nineveh was the leading Assyrian city from around 705 until it was destroyed in 612. During this period, the Assyrians were the greatest threat against Israel and Judah. Only in the 7th century did Nineveh become an important city. In 612, the Medes and the Babylonians destroyed the city, and it was never rebuilt. The city of Nineveh seems to have become a bit of a legend in the ancient world. It retained its notoriety as a powerful city, but details about it are not so clear after its destruction. We see this reflected in the text of Jonah, where he says it takes three days to walk across it. Now, the archaeological site of Nineveh is well excavated and well known, and so we can say it is by no means a three-day walk across. Only a legendary city would be given such dimensions, or it's being intentionally exaggerated. Speaking of legendary cities, this role was also often applied to the city of Tarshish in Near Eastern literature. In the Bible, it's a byword for faraway places. Going to Tarshish is like going to Timbuktu or Shangri-La or Atlantis. Now, Tarshish was a historical place, but we aren't sure exactly where it was. The most likely candidates are the island of Sardinia in the western uh, Mediterranean, or Tartessos 
a region with a shared language and culture in southern Spain, which also was an important Phoenician trading outpost. Now, as Nineveh was a byword for a legendary hated and evil place, Tarshish is a semi-mythical faraway place. We can see that the Book of Jonah employs many literary tropes that would have been recognized as legendary elements in the ancient world. We haven't even talked about him being swallowed by a giant fish and vomited up after three days. Now, given these literary elements, we think it's best to look at Jonah as not having a specific historical context. The author seems to go out of their way to avoid giving a specific context. No kings are mentioned. No other chronological indicators are given. All these elements point to Jonah as a story that uses an obscure figure from the Book of Kings as a vehicle to tell a story about God's forgiveness. It's not, not meant to be read as an historical account with an historical setting, like many of the other prophetic books. It turns out that Jonah is the ideal figure for that message about God's forgiveness. In Kings, he delivered a message of forgiveness to an Israelite king who otherwise didn't deserve it. In the book of Jonah, he takes that message to a people widely hated in the ancient world, and he takes it to Nineveh, the city that was the center of the Assyrian Empire at the, heart of it, at the height of its power, but which had also since passed into ruin and legend. I think that if we try to place this story in a specific historical context and nail it down to a tight historical window when these events could have happened, we miss the point of the book. Now, on the other hand, if we don't have enough context, if we don't understand that Nineveh was the center of a hated empire, that the historical Jonah was a prophet who had a message of forgiveness, we can likewise miss some of the impact of the story. The book of Jonah is a good example of the way that the Bible can convey truth, in this case the availability of God's forgiveness to all people, without every story or book being necessarily historical. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any upcoming videos. If you learned something new today, be sure to take a minute and share this video with your friends. Until next time, keep digging.